Hey guys, it's Pear. I did chapter 7 called Do Sex Hormones Really Exist? So in this chapter, oops, um, we're talking about sex hormones and uh, she argues that the chemicals that we're referring to have been needlessly gendered. It doesn't make sense to talk about them the way that we do. And she talks about two big points of research. One you could call diversity, which is that the chemicals, these steroid molecules, interact with many bodily systems. It's not just reproduction related. For example, they're related to heart disease, nutrition, pain, to uh, pain tolerance, aggression, cooperation, female road rage came up, uh, lots of different things. And also, these hormones do not just appear in the, the female hormones do not appear just in women and the male hormones do not just appear in men. What's important to understand is that scientists understood these two big points back in 1939. Um, Fausta Sterling asks, why weren't sex hormones seen from the beginning as the ubiquitous, powerful growth hormones that they are? And the answer is something like this. The scientists who measured and named the gonadal factors entwined gender so intricately into their conceptual framework that we still can't pull them apart. So I'll talk a little bit about the scientists here. In 1939, a 1,000-plus page book came out. It was pretty big. It was called Sex and Internal Secretions. And it was about all the major research that had been done on sex hormones from about 1923 to 1939. And uh, she's really impressed with the science. Like, she really goes into some depth here about appreciating the science and just amazing work that happened. I'll come back. <laughs> um, and there were even some signs in this book that traditional notions of what gender was might be challenged by the research to follow in the book. For example, in the introductory remarks, we have this quote, there is no such biological entity as sex. What exists in nature is a dimorphism into male and female individuals. In any given species, we recognize a male form and a female form, whether these characteristics be classes of biological, da da da. Sex is not a force that produces these contrasts. It is merely a name for the total impression of the differences. And Fausta Sterling adds that it's, this guy sounds a little social constructivist here. It is difficult to divest ourselves of the pre-scientific anthropomorphism, and we have been particularly slow in the field of scientific study of sex characteristics in divesting ourselves not only of the terminology, but also of the influence of such ideas. And this was Frank Lilly, a really prominent biochemist, who's giving the uh, introduction here. But is he a forgotten scientific visionary? No, in fact, he was at the very center of what was going on. Uh, in this world of research, and unfortunately could not take his own advice. While he acknowledged that all individuals contained the rudiments of all sex characters, whether male or female, he still wrote of male and female hormones, quote, as there are two sets of sex characters, so there are two sets of sex hormones, yada yada. This was in the same book in which he had given that introduction. So what happened? Again, there were human scientists, there's a human story here, and they had to measure and name things in a particular way, and their methods still affect our perceptions today. So there was this thing, the endocrinal, endo, endoc, endocrinal gold rush, you could call it. Whoops. Uh-oh. Sorry, my presentation farted. Uh, so after World War I is around the time they figured out how to uh, get to these molecules that were in the gonads, uh, these sex hormones, and uh, there was a huge push to understand sex because they were talking, not only was um, the uh, women's suffrage movement going on, this is also, there was a lot going on socially and people were very concerned about how to address um, a lot of social problems through science. And uh, to do a little bit of manual work here. Oh, okay, let's continue. Okay, so this is actually a little graph diagram from the book, and 
uh, Fausta Sterling emphasizes that there were a lot of new partnerships that happened around this time. A lot of people were interested in sex hormones. So actually, John D. Rockefeller donated a lot of money and helped create some organizations created by the government. So a lot of money was going into sex hormone research. You also have the commercial side here, people were coming up with all kinds of, you know, miracle youth formulas and things like that. There's always those people. And then you have the feminists and the labor movement, sexology, uh, you know, which led to Kinsey later on, also funded by these people and these organizations. And this is also when the social sciences really came into their own, so there's a lot going on here. <clears throat> so eventually this committee was created because the impulses and activities associated with sex behavior and reproduction are fundamentally important for the welfare of the individual, the family, the community, the race. So sex was becoming a big deal. So at first, it started as a much more open, sincere effort. They said, let's try to understand this. This is a really huge thing that we haven't talked about as a society. Um, but unfortunately, it got hijacked because there were biologists at the top. And, uh, <laughs> and one of the big reasons that they succeeded in taking it mostly in the direction of biology rather than psychology or all these other disciplines that could have informed the pursuit um, of understanding sex, they... Um, they were uh, in favor of eugenics, which is sort of summed up in this quote. We are at a turning point in the history of human society. The populations press on the borders everywhere. And also, unfortunately, the best stock biologically is not everywhere the most rapidly breeding stock. The political and social problems involved are fundamentally problems of genetic biology. It seems this was quite common belief at the time. It was not uncommon to believe that poverty and crime were a matter of weak heredity rather than, well, won't go there. So, continue. So also, um, feminists, activists were also really interested in hormones because uh, they're trying to create a technology that could control birth, birth control. So there was lots of money for sex hormones, there was lots of pride, lots of optimism. Endocrinology opened the door to the chemistry of the soul. One, uh, one scientist said at the time. So then there's the science. And uh, we're going to look at these two parts that uh, she talks about. One is the step of purification and measuring. How do they actually purify and measure these hormones? And she really, like, loves the science. She has so much respect. For example, um, she gives serious props to these scientists who had to extract 20, 50 milligrams of hormones from about 25,000 liters of urine collected from policemen in Berlin. And that's just one example. Like, they just, this is like the big part of the chapter is talking about the, some of the specific stuff that the scientists did. And it's really pretty amazing. Like, these are respectable scientists. So anyway, at first the, the conceptual framework started very simply. Men have male hormones, women have female hormones. Perfect. But then there were complications. Um, for example, there was not just one hormone. There was not just one male hormone, one female hormone. There were actually families of uh, molecules, chemicals that pertain. So you have not actually estrogen, you have estrog estrogens and androgens, and testosterone is an androgen, anyway. And also, like I said before, sex hormones were showing up in the opposite sexes. Um, she brings up a pretty funny passage where people just could not believe when a scientist found uh, female hormones, quote, in a stallion in copious amounts. It just, everyone flipped their shit. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Um, and also, research was showing that male hormones were affecting female bodies and vice versa. And, uh, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know how to use computer. Um, so, it was sort of a thing of fitting a square peg into a round dualistic scheme. Um, they came up with some other ideas, maybe, like, why were there 
female hormones in a man, well, maybe they're inert heterosexual hormones that do nothing. They just float around, and they're a byproduct of things you eat and stuff. And other people suggested, well, maybe these heterosexual hormones um, create disease, but they quickly ruled that out because gen the men were pretty healthy. <laughs> and uh, so in general, um, it was hard to reconcile the results um, because people were using such different methods to measure and observe what was going on with hormones, like psychologists who would look at the behavioral changes, um, and people were working on chickens and rats and stuff and looking at uteruses or feathers, so they needed some sort of standardization. And uh, there was a big fancy conference, and, uh, and they agreed that um, the sort of the basic test would be that something along these lines, I'm a little, did not quite sure I understood the science, but I think it's something along these lines, that if an animal had its ovaries removed and you introduced the, quote, female hormones, you could induce estrus. I had to look that up. That means in heat, period of fertility. So really pulling it into this reproductive thing. Now, people brought that up and said, but this is silly. We already know that hormones affect other processes and stuff. Why just tie this to the sex process, the estrus? And uh, the line is, if sex hormones are not sex-specific, could they legitimately be called sex hormones? Did sex hormones really exist? So, title of the chapter, yay. Now, for men, there is no male estrus, so they sort of just came up with a certain quantity of hormone that shows up in the body, and that's like a standard something. So, that's kind of, there was no big problem there. <clears throat> So basically, after they created these standards, um, these hormones, these steroid, it's actually a type of steroid, these molecules, um, which affect everything else, almost everything else in the body, they became sex hormones because of how they were standardized. And any interactions that they had with other parts of the body became sexual. So we called like the hormone affecting, like est estrogen affecting the liver, that's a sexual thing because we created sex hormones, and we called it sexual because we called the thing sexual. Um, <clears throat> so here's a good quote. Uh, the choice of measurement that distanced animal mac masculinity from reproduction linked animal femininity directly to a cycle of generation and made less visible the effects of these hormones on non-productive... Um, that's not a complete quote, but that's the same idea. <laughs> So, and then they also had to name these um, hormones. And uh, Fausto Sterling points out that there was actually a lot of restraint in the beginning for the first 10 years or so. They just kind of called the male hormones, female hormones. And there's a bit of a complicated history about this, but eventually they decided to call the male hormones androgens and the female hormones estrogens. Androgens meaning loosely to make a man. And again, this idea of estrus comes in. To create estrus is the meaning of estrogen. So again, the ideal, the, the fabrication of female hormones became linked to the idea of female reproduction. So do sex hormones exist? Um, so scientists were noting the ambiguity but still persisting that sex has to exist. Keep in mind this is a very socially dynamic time. Um, there was this conflict because women had to sort of uh, be aware that they had to function as a group, but also they didn't want to be seen as women, quote, in everyday activities. Um, Fausto Sterling says, amid such turmoil, turmoil is never possible to resolve the identity of the sex hormones. Um, so she suggests alternatives. We, we should say that they are steroid hormones affecting most, if not all, of the body's organ systems. And I'll leave you with this quote from the very end, which kind of wraps the whole thing up. I'm running out of time on my little timer thingy here that records my screen. So with that, take care, enjoy. It was a good chapter.